Hello everyone, it is my honor to convene this session for the Taiwan Exhibition series of seminars under the main project titled Impossible Dreams. This session focuses on the difficulty and desire that underlie the belief in the concept of the National Pavilion within a particular mode of global Biennale production. The session is titled, What Makes a Pavilion? What Does a Pavilion Make? It reflects on the impulses that generate the attraction to a pavilion in Venice or by extension to any national representation elsewhere via an exhibition. What does it mean and what does it take to organize a pavilion around a nation or any other unifying or consolidating entity? And what does the effort seek to achieve? Viewed from a historical perspective, this reflection on the context of the pavilion over the years discusses certain concerns related to the origins and transformations of the Taiwan presence in Venice. From the archive exhibition currently in Venice, this session converses with the filmmaker Tsai Ming Liang's It's a Dream, done in 2007 and presented in the same year in the Biennale. It is a heartfelt passage into an aspiration to belong to a community or become a believer in images or a faithful of exhibitions. Filmed in a cinema house in Kuala Lumpur, we get a glimpse of the everyday life of a family eating and watching movies and mingling with strangers. Could this be a fantasy of togetherness and the experience of collective imagination, a sentiment that the National Pavilion likewise expresses and elicits? Or could it be an act of reclaiming a space to further complicate notions of possessions and boundaries? In this light, the other urgent entry point of this session to emerge from the archive exhibition in Venice is Yao Jui Chung's 1994 project called Territorial Takeover that was presented in Venice in 1997. Unfolding before us is a series of photographs that evokes the artist's visits to and investigations into historic sites in Taiwan. He takes photographs of himself stark naked and urinating on the spaces like an animal recovering its ground. We are honored today by the generosity of our speakers who have made the time to share their insights into the theme of the session. They come from different backgrounds and offer diverse perspectives from art history, curatorship, and artistic practice across equally diverse geographies, Taiwan, Kosovo, Albania, New York, Equatorial Guinea, and Barcelona. Let me now introduce them to you. Man Ray Su is an independent curator and critic who has invested in developing platforms for the indigenous presence in Taiwan contemporary art. His curatorial projects include the 2000 Taipei Biennial titled The Sky is the Limit, co-curated with Jerome Sands. The Good Place and International Cityscapes Intervention in 2001, co-curated with Hong John Lin, and How Big is the World in 2002, and the 2008 Taipei Biennial, curated with uh, Vasif Kortun, among others. He also served as a jury member for the 49th Venice Biennale, a jury member of the UNESCO Prize for the 7th Istanbul Biennial in 2001, as well as for the 2006 Hermes Prize for Korean contemporary artists. Sisle Jaffa is a well-spoken Kosovan Albanian contemporary artist based in New York. He is known for his artistic investigation of socio-economic political realities that are linked up with the various complexities of modern society. He has participated in different group exhibitions since 1998, such as Camera Camera during the OVNI Festival in France in 2018, Circus of Truth at the Beaux-Arts Centre for Fine Arts in Belgium in 2019, and a story for the future at the Maxi Museum in Rome, Italy in 2020. Jaffa has also produced one-person exhibitions since 1997. Among his recent shows were Lost and Found for the 2017 Pavilion of the Republic of Kosovo, uh, of the 57th Venice Biennale, which was curated by Arta Agani, Rosa Athul at the National Fine Arts Museum in Havana in 2018, and his 2021 public work titled Bieta in Tirana, Albania. 
Finally, Elvira Giangani Ose is a curator, art historian, and currently the director of the Museo d'Art Contemporanee de Barcelona, or MACBA, a lecturer at Goldsmiths in London, and a member of the Thought Council at the Fondazione Prada. She was part of the curatorial team of the 2016 Biennale du Lamage, a mouvement in Geneva, and curated international art at the Tate in London. She was the curator of the eighth edition of the Gutenberg International Biennial for Contemporary Art in 2015. She previously served as the curator of the Centro Atlantico de Arte Moderno and the Centro Andaluz de Arte Contemporaneo, the artistic director of Recontre Pichal Lubumbashi Biennial in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, guest curator of the Triennial Sud, Salon Urban du Dulala in 2010, and chief curator of the Showroom Gallery in London. What is a pavilion? We will think that we will put pavilion in a pavilion. But the pavilion is a Gallery或者相对于美术馆 电影包含着建筑，啊，那当然就是视觉艺术，啊，好几个类型，哈，所以这些的展览馆呢，啊，在被拿来呃当做是这个每一个国家啊，在表现它在在现它自己的时候呢，啊，就所用的这种馆呢
的同意之下，建构了台湾馆啊，建构了台湾馆，就是现在的普利吉奥尼啊，这个呃、啊、展览馆。那到了一九九九年的时候啊，中华呃呃这个呃人民共和国啊 PRC 啊了解到说，哎、欸，这件事情是不可。呃，原谅的哈，所以就推催促啊，意大利政府把台湾呢啊逐出啊国家馆的行列啊。那二零零一年呢啊，台湾呢才变成是这个呃，就是说呃呃平行展的一部分啊。从此以后，台湾啊在威尼斯其实是没有国家馆的啊，没有国家馆的。那甚至于啊。呃，威尼斯基金会呢，也不允许台湾啊的这个馆呢啊，呃，自己称为是 pavilion 啊。那么 pavilion 这个字呢啊，在威尼斯的呃呃呃基金会的严格定义之下呢，事实上就是啊，具有联合国啊代表位置的那个什么那个那个那个国家馆的意思。啊，那当然，呃，从二零零零年以后呢，台湾呃的这个馆的这个策展人呢，啊，运用了啊几种不同的方式哈、啊，把这个 pavilion 这个字呢，啊，放在这个呃台湾的这个展览里面哈，啊，虽然是说，呃呃，总而言之呢，啊，威尼斯基金会呢是不认可啊，就是台湾使用 pavilion 啊这个禁忌。啊，语词，啊，那反过来说呢，我们当然知道说，呃呃 ，pavilion 这个词啊，事实上，呃，原始的意义就是一个临时的展览馆啊。那这种临时的展览馆呢，啊，在整个呃全世界的、啊、现行的这个脉络之下呢，事实上有很重要的一个意义啊。那个意义就是说，我们啊。能够在一个啊短短的五个月、六个月的时间啊，能够让啊世界各地很多国家、不同的社会的啊呃艺术圈的呃呃呃创作者啊，来到啊同一个地方啊来进行展示。那这些展示的呃呃呃。呃呃，作品跟展览呢，啊，就充满各式各样的一种一种状态啊，所以威尼斯双年展在这个意义上面呢，啊，它有一个很重要的一个部分哈、啊，就是说啊，它呃呃，其实是一个整个全球艺术圈的一个缩影啊，来到威尼斯，你不是看到的是一不是看一个展览，事实上你是会看到三五百个展览，每一届都是这个样子。啊，那这个是威尼斯双年展呢，在当代的双年展的脉络当中啊，纯粹是真的有别于其他双年展的地方啊。其他的双年展呢，通常就是自己各自一个展览啊，一个大展览就叫双年展啊。那如果从一个城市啊，拥有几个不同的小展览出现，那也就是呃，在那个时地方啊，那个时间里面看到这个城市的艺术的能量啊。但是威尼斯不同，威尼斯的双年展的那个几个月的时间，你是看到全世界的艺术能量，啊，全世界的艺术能量。那这个当然也就代表了啊，威尼斯啊呃、啊、帝国的一个重要的一个精神啊，十五六世纪以来啊，真正建立起所谓现代世界啊的这个威尼斯啊帝国呢啊，它的精神力量呢啊就被。啊，重新呈现在这个威尼斯双年展的这个脉络里面，啊，那当然这样子讲，并不表示说啊，这个是一个完全呃平等的一个状态啊。如果我们说啊，这个展览的机会啊，能够呈现世界上很多不同国家、不同社会的呃呃呃呃艺术的力量的话呢，我们也应该要认知。说这个呃呃，整个全世界啊，还有很多的
呃呃社会，就特别是说啊、呃、原住民、少数民族的啊、呃、这些社群，他们啊、呃、保有的。啊，艺术创作能量啊，事实上是远远的啊，没有在啊威威尼斯双年展的这个脉络中啊被呈现出来啊。那这个呢，也是一个我们对于啊呃将来啊几年甚至数十年之后啊，对威尼斯双年展呢啊它的一种全球期望啊，一种全球更加平衡主义式的啊呃呈现艺术。呃呃，立场艺术力量的一个地方啊，这个是一个，就是我们对于 Pavilion 的一个啊的一个期待啊 ，Pavilion 是一个啊临时性的啊展示的地方啊，那么这个呃呃、啊、威尼斯双年展呢啊，应该是啊啊数百个啊 Pavilion 所组成的一个状态啊，每一个临时的展览。啊，代表着是各个不同社会、各个不同的啊国家、地区啊的艺术能量。Hi, good morning.、Um, uh, uh, first of all, thank you so much for invitation in this forum of Taiwan Pavilion, and I'm very pleased to be part of it. Um. So, so I'm Cisley Jaffa. I'm from Kosovo. I live in New York. And to me, was great honor to be part of this incredible journey of questioning what the national pavilion mean and what does pavilion make the. And and question the identity itself, and to me, it's a it's a it's a part of my special、uh, questioning daily, based not only the what pavilion in general speak about it, but what what the present identity they that actually take part of this event. In a larger scale than Biennale, Biennale Venice.、Uh, what makes pavilion and what does a pavilion make? It's to me a question more、uh, thinking of、uh, how we are dictated by, especially terms, and、um, and especially the the system of art of we think. And、uh, we believe into certain norms of presentation because, because in somehow we think that we define ourselves in one moment of time.、Uh, but it's bigger than this. To me, a role of artist, especially questioning themselves with.、Uh, It's a time of transition we live, especially what Taiwan today is、uh, facing、um, in geopolitics, and it's a role of artists to highlight that complexity of living and、uh, and 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 inventing their own self with the time we we live.、Um, when we think of the pavilion. To me, is just the word that do not justify the action of artists itself or the choice of the artists that make to present the work.、Uh, since the identity is always in mutation, there is never static into it. I I will never somehow put in the box of 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 putting things that、um, that. Taiwan quality, especially in terms of individual quality, that、uh, can present and somehow can be identified. To me,、uh, the role of special artist and living in Taiwan and coming abroad, it's、um, it's、uh, I see in the global scale how being Taiwanese or being from Albania, from Kosovo. 
and since we still struggle to 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 resist towards the time and as as I think resistance is constantly it's existential when you when we think of a person who live in Bangladesh wake up in the morning to resist for tea or in New York someone wake up in the morning and resist for a good coffee or in Italy for a good pasta or in Switzerland for good cheese question is how we can resist to mutate ourselves through the time where we live with information we have and with the platform that we build to create kind of national pavilion and what the national pavilion mean to individuals that relation between thing that what individual mean and what the pavilion make or what does mean is two things separated because the spirit of the artist in 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 a thing the way i i see and i think i reflect towards everyday life it's uh, not something that we can make ourselves a big container and to satisfy some national identities uh, we have our depth that uh, we can uh, we can highlight that our weakness and our power uh, through something that is more journey as being something magic of course the pavilion in general speaking uh, never satisfies it's just because give the platform of criticism but what the national identity mean in terms of relation with the pavilion itself it's a big question mark and to me the power of the artwork is not an is materialization of the soul of the artist it's a relation it's not object, uh, object, uh, objective to reach, but it's experience to share. And that I do believe the artist from Taiwan, and especially in terms of the pavilion, what mean in general speaking, uh, it's uh, for me more political attitude towards uh, event like, 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 like Biennale it is, and the artist's role into this is stay in the shadow most of the time. Um, speaking of the what what does uh, really make a pavilion, uh, to me, it's emptiness of the thought, especially when you think of the distance where we live, that I do believe the distance do not exist because that it's invention of human uh, and uh, but the emotion would be shared with the, our um, our place where we born and where where we come from it's very sacred to us but that sacred being where we come from especially when we think of the terms of let's say Taiwan or Kosovo coming from Bulgaria or from Nigeria it's exactly the power of individuals that can share that experience in that term of making that to fulfill this activity, the pavilion. The pavilion itself, it's not for me important um, because it's a ephemeral, it's a, with no, no kind of life into it, in general speaking. But we, we have to reinvent the new way of thinking what this role of artists in relation with politics today and relation with the social impact what we have today with the wars what we're going through with the threat of blackmail from different countries like example in this case uh, being uh, living around in taiwan in ukraine and all the and kosovo too as well what that hunger of the artist itself can make us something really special and we can highlight that beauty of who we are with something really unique. 
uh, structurally thinking uh, pavilions are just architectures and architecture in general speaking for me with all respect with architects it is something that we think of functionality think of something rational and we have to think let's say i want to use ironically to if you want to go to the bathroom you have to flush the water and we have to know where the water go and where to come that is architecture and when you think of the art it's a more irrational approach towards the thing and especially when we think of what we make something really special so we have to get out of pavilion of thinking out of structure that we can have a comfort zone of 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 of, of materialization of our journey because that's something really crucial really really important and to me that is something essence of to speak especially when when the pavilion really mean uh, when i first time I, I i i i was a part of venice biennale in 97 i invented the mobile pavilion the pavilion that do not exist but illegal pavilion and and that kind of attitude towards architecture especially and with the hijack especially the beauty of the power of the art make uh, less power presence of the artist and become more important the structure and architecture itself speaking today like example in Venice Biennale especially today and there was a comment to which kind of pavilions are more interesting and which one is less and uh, an artist too and I came to my personal definition of today example the best pavilion let's say of this impossible in this case really dream but I can say possible dream because there is no dream that is not possible you know and um, an example, the the Russian pavilion was something one really interesting to talk about how how the pavilion without no presence closed become a masterpiece. And but 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 that is attitude of the artist that rejected to be part of affiliated with the power and with the statement that they wrote and especially the curator that decided. It's a very interesting think process of what really Pavlov make some engaged and commit towards the Venice like like Venice Biennale. So th saying that, uh, without underestimating other other countries that present, especially the other other artists, and I think that's something that we can start thinking how the pavilion without being pavilion itself can be so important then sometimes just because what is crucial to me as an artist i think we should be not desired in terms of being to the public audience because being desired means being consumed and when we be undesired and we make this our audience that pavilion be more attractive, maybe something that strange can happen and the artist can have some self-satisfaction of being non-desired. So when I think relationship with the identity and the pavilion itself, and I'm sorry that if I float from different conversation and I come back again to the what art mean, in that terms in relation with uh, big venues like uh, like uh, like like uh, Venice Biennale uh, to me the dreams in that case especially it's in a Taiwanese pavilion especially it's tangible it's a real it's and and that that beauty of of that uh, especially when somebody really kind of um, like that see beyond of, of themselves and try to share that experience and that reality when dreams become reality especially in this case that become impossible dream but this is the dream of reality it's something that we can we can think how the power of the art 
can bring things more real, more tangible, and and therefore we can build something that we do not put ourselves into some kind of angle of being uh, impossible to rethink ourselves and to reinvent ourselves. So, speaking about that in general speaking, I think we uh, we cannot play the safe games. And that I do think that that is a role of artists to to try to to reinvent themselves at the time and and how we can invent our time with artwork and consciously, if you think. But uh, but uh, that is a power of art, and uh, and in that circumstances, uh, I think we should personally think relationship. What really pavilions make, it's the power of the art, it's a poetry, it's the, it's the beauty and ugliness of we can embrace. And I think that is something really special. Now, let me smoke a little bit. I need to smoke a pipe. So, so this is not dream, this is reality. And speaking of that, I think what what pavilion make in this case i have to say one more thing is that hunger of the artist to build something really special and continuously being hungry intellectually thinking without without playing the comfort zone and but today we have to reinvent we have to reinvent continuously because it's not possible to live in this kind of form of commodity of thinking, of making ourselves hijacked by any kind of kind of identity, kind of nationalism or any any kind of form of uh, architecture that we can be in the shadow. What what I think that what is that role of an artist to question themselves, especially when come to the national identities. Uh, we should question ourselves with the time where we live. Because today I come from Taiwan, tomorrow I come from New York, and after tomorrow I come from South Africa, or after tomorrow I come from Kosovo. So I can be perfect, be traitor, you know, traitor. Traitor, I trade, I betrayed myself. But that part of thinking of what betrayed me in political means, but in, in artistical means, I do believe that the beauty that we have of, of human contradiction, it's something that we move forward and we push ourselves more without we get hijacked by, by the terms or by any kind of form. But we should always question ourselves in terms of what really mean to be part and to think of the time where we live, to to be in the reinvented continuously, and to be contradict ourselves, but that is something that I truly believe. So, yeah, contradict ourselves. I think this is something that we should rethink. So, yeah, and what what uh, what I think the biggest problem in in that case of thinking of what national pavilion mean and I think in relation it's architectures architecture in general buildings that we think that this is a place that we should be presented but that is not fair to the to the to the artist and especially to the artwork they want to present because because the the space become more important than the art itself and that is big is a big question to me so the mobility, the kind of new attitude of the individual artists, especially pavilions that can reinvent themselves differently, differently than can be uh, taking refuge into the spaces that can make people feel comfortable, especially in terms of national pavilion. I have my doubt. And I have, uh, I have uh, my 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 thoughts in regards to that.
So to me, the role of artists is really to question that. And especially today, that we live such a global world, global, global dynamics and the speed of information we have and we share and, and it's a big question. So, and uh, speaking about where I come from, especially from Kosovo, and even today we still struggle with, uh, with the things of where we are surrounded by, by countries that especially they do not embrace our progress and they do not embrace our beauty, who we are. It's exactly hunger, that kind of stimulation that they give to us individually that we try to give to the world, especially not as a mission, not mission reaction, but as a solidarity of thinking what individual creativity can make things, that our voice, especially individual voice, can be highlighted in the world and coming from where we come from. Especially in the case I trust the, the great artist from Taiwan, who I think are amazing energy, and that hunger needs to be cultivated and I do believe in that. So the National Pavilion become, in this case, the shadow of the power of the art and artist itself. So I believe that we need to reinvent ourselves. Thank you so much and we'll see you in the session. Bye. What makes a pavilion? Um, when Patrick Flores invited me to think about the Taiwanese pavilion for the Venice Biennial for, for this set of forums, I thought of bringing an example of both counter-narratives and counter-politics in the making of, uh, let's say, of the discourse of a nation-state into um, formulation of art. Because if we think about pavilion in the context of an exhibition project such as um, the Biennale di Venezia, what we have in front of us is a formulation in terms of exhibition making of uh, a sort of imaginary or social imaginary, political imaginary or artistic imaginary of a nation building. Um, there is something that beautiful that uh, Patrick Flores reminded us in his introduction to this forum, which is the fact that none of the ideas of the pavilion had been one or the same. But what is interesting about this is that our all projection on the part of the artists and the curators of what will constitute uh, a formulation of what Taiwan is in, in those purposes. And I thought to bring uh, an example which has to do with nation building through uh, a festival or a structure, and that is the new Black and African world that comes to terms when uh, the first stack 1977 was designed. And, and it talks about the process of nation building in, in Nigeria, uh, first upon gaining independence of Britain in 1960, but secondly and more importantly, at the surrender of the secessionist state of Biafra, whose regime lasted until the, between the 1967 and 1970. And this new nation that came to exist in 1917, a nation presenting itself as a paradigm of a new African nation state that is somehow exemplified and a stage in what we consider now uh, the Festac. And it's, and it's such a, an interesting, I remember this Andrew Apter um, book, The Pan-African Nation, uh, Oil and a Spectacle of the Culture in Nigeria, when he talks about the, the, the development no, that made possible uh, the boom of this new nation, which is the oil boom. And is this Nigerians, as, it, as Apter observed, the Nigerian newly found God-given wealth that reunited the nation with an unprecedented prosperity, portending an state-directed industrial revolution that will be lubricated by oil. And that sense of something beyond the, let's say, the, the imaginary, no? because in this case, it's not only the sense of um, 
a, a, a nation that had to come to terms together after the Biafran uh, war, but also um, what are the, the things that could be recognized and organized as a national body. And, and this is clear, and it will be you know, this sense of a communal Pan-African objective, something that will not only serve the purpose of showing the constitution of a resilient nationalism, but, but the, the sense in which, um, the, let's say, a new understanding of what translocal and transnationalism, these forms of community that were being addressed, no? the mysterious relationship between nationalism, modernity, money, value, and in some, produces new insight and commentaries on the anthropology of the state in Africa. So these are, for me, key components of a national cultural project that then will uh, be uh, transformed into what was a call or name or known as the Second World Festival of Black and African Arts and Culture, uh, FESTAC, which was hosted in Lagos in 1977. So FESTAC, in a way, served as this patriotic purpose. No? Between 1975 and 1976, there is a constitutional drafting committee which was concerned to prepare the return of the civilian rule and identify this multi-ethnic society in a political imperative, solving all the issues about this new state, the creation of the feeling of belonging and involvement in various sections of the economy, right? Like thinking about how Festac could not only signify, uh, let's say, the moment of, of projection, international projection of such prosperity and an encounter that was first and foremost cultural, but also sociopolitical and economic. And what is interesting about this is the fact that Artists, for instance, I remember a, a beautiful conversation between Jimmy Solanke, Bruce Navrapella, and, and uh, Ophelia Moon, uh, the poet, uh, around what it means art in their own terms, and what it means art in, in the way in which art was orchestrated to this notion of nation building and through this formulation of the multi ethnic uh, society from the part of the Nigerian government. And perhaps it's because of the sense in which these two things came together into the form of a festival is that I want to use this as an example of how the formulation of a cultural event, of a pavilion, no? in the case of an, a pavilion in, in the context of, of Venice, could signify the restaging, the reenactment, the even even beyond the let's say the artists, the particular artists or the particular uh, curator, uh, the restaging of those um, let's say the imaginary of the dreams, the impossible dreams, if we are to follow uh, Patrick Flores of what a nation considers should define them through uh, an artistic or cultural project. So there is part of the a pavilion that signified also a sort of a, a, a cultural representation, right, of, of a desire. What is it uh, goes beyond the art that we see in themselves and because it is in a context in which other nation states are represented, there is part of this almost an exercise of translation on the part of what uh, the, the artists and the curator are presenting, as if there is a sense of, in this case, Taiwanese contemporariness that is replicated. The same way that in the case of the Festag, there was a sense of Nigerian, uh, again, a multi-ethnic Nigerian, a black an African Nigerian, a Pan African Nigerian, a Pan African nation state that was presented to the world and that was to, to be understood as the, the translation uh, for all those other values uh, for the rest of the African nation, but that also for the world that was seeing them from afar. I was also considering what makes 
the viewer, uh, the context, right? To absorb whatever is presented within the context of a pavilion as a geographically or national state driven. Right? Um, one of the things that I have always discussed is the fact that the geogra geography or provenance is not necessarily an aesthetic uh, condition or an aesthetic category. So then what does it mean to be a national pavilion? What value does it add to the world that is presented in it? Finally, if we were to consider uh, what does a pavilion make uh, in the way in which um, it formulates uh, the sense of publicness, uh, we should consider the emergence of transdisciplinary aesthetics in urban Africa as defined by artist collective initiative and sociopolitical movements in modern Africa uh, in an aesthetic that is neither the depository of modern ideologies on national culture as determined by the newly independent nation states cultural policy, nor that he pursued um, the colonizing or identitarian uh, framework. It is rooted rather in a clear commitment to the notion of the social, of the collective, and in the belief that political revolution can eventually be effective in aesthetic terms and that art can bring about social justice. And representational politics through the proposal of the pavilion constitutes such justice as well. This aesthetic begins in the late 1970s, but only in the past three decades has it notably proliferated. Whereas in recent scholarship and knowledge, uh, international events such as in the 1990s, uh, Dakar, uh, the Biennial of the, the Lara African Contemporain, as a sort of significant shift in the contemporary African art and aesthetic, I would propose instead that is in the local initiative led by artist collectives against cultural narrative and policies proposed by national institutions that one can find the genesis for change and experimentation within the fundamental um, to the uh, fundamental to this equation, as well as uh, are the cross cultural conversation of a Pan African and African diasporic character taking place through the 20th century, but which took on a crucial significance since the late 1960s in relation to major international festivals and professional encounters, such as the World Festival, the First World Festival of Negro Art in Senegal in 66, the first Pan-African Cultural Festival, Panaf in Algiers in 1969, and the Second World Class, uh, Second World Black and African Festival of Arts and Culture, uh, FESTAC, uh, 1977, to which I have referred yes, uh, earlier in, in Lagos, in Nigeria. This uh, historical uh, analysis of these events may provide an alternative narration of history that consists, or that can assist us, sorry, um, not only in the understanding of an inherent role of arts in politics, but also reactivating our political relationship to the practice of art in the realm of global politics. And in a way, I see in the presentation of these formulations in you know, the Forum for African Art, other initiative uh, run by some of the members uh, of the editorial board of ENCA, uh, journal, uh, Open West or Al Hassan or Logibe, but also in the efforts of Fernando Albin and Simon Yami and, and people like Gillian Tavadros, the formulation of such a ten, the, 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 the need to create and legitimate a stage um, within the context of this global politics that in the case of an exhibition like uh, Venice, it is presented through uh, through the uh, this this no, is is this an staging of such uh, global politics as well. What does a pavilion make? Um, 
I remember recently I attended, uh, well, actually in part, uh, a lecture uh, to a group of artists, and I was asking them to define in one word uh, what were the, um, the terms that will help them to explain what, they, what it meant for them an exhibition, right? And one of the first words that came out was legitimacy. And of course, a pavilion uh, brings together a platform, a space of translation, um, a space of that in which your work is subordinated by other subjects that has to do, obviously, with the fact that you're included within the context of a nation's building narrative. But at the same time, despite the grammar and the language of pavilion, let's say, makingness, <laughs> There is something very specific, which is it does give you a platform, it give you a stage of representation. In that sense also uh, is an opportunity for freedom on the one hand, an opportunity to be presented in your own right once all those other considerations about the space and the platform where you are, are overcome. And what is interesting to me is this sense of how, for instance, spaces that do not have a pavilion need to find in contexts like Venice, a space in which they could also represent. So then what the pavilion makes, it makes a space almost like a field, you know, a space like Venice, they feel like an estratego, where everybody has to have their own little case. Case number from which to play, in this, let's say, world staging uh, a scenario. And what is interesting for me in this case is that some of the references to um, the opportunities that these mega exhibitions offer in the context of the pavilion is also to present, to give visibility, to offer a quote-unquote limitless presentation to some of these artists. Uh, I was thinking also in terms of Africa uh, and African representations in, in, um, in international pavilions, how for so long the representation of African art was mediated through the representation of thematics approach, but it was always from the perspective of the continent somehow framed into uh, a collective exhibition in the sort of, uh, let's say, uh, nation uh, state making. I remember, for instance, uh, when Forum for African Art used to present those sort of exhibitions. And, and again, thinking in the definition that uh, somebody like Oquen Weser, the late Oquen Weser gave us in relation to the MIGA exhibition, not thinking about the collective representation the African shows that were presented through the Africa Forum or the presentation of the collection uh, of Sindicato Colo were never intentionally to be considered pavilions, but were operating within the framework of the pavilion making in a context like Venice, right? And what was interesting in the way that, um, that for instance, uh, Okwi talks about uh, the, the, the formulation of the MIGA exhibition will say no, that it has a grammar and a language of its own, but the help to uh, perhaps is the only stage for certain words to appear. So certain artists, we had known them through the possibility of this collective endeavor that were uh, in their own right happening, not only in the, in the form of a pavilion, but also as an exhibition, as a collective exhibition on its own. But it was the only the opportunities for so many artists to be presented, and also for so many nations that originally were not included in the first composition of the Venice Biennial as this nation state uh, uh, platform of propaganda uh, that needed to every year uh, go to Venice, pay the real estate, and have a presentation or the pavilion. Right? So there is something about this. And I was thinking in the beautiful and one of the latest projects that the Forum for African Art did, Fault Line, no? uh, as the fractures uh, in the airs, of, in the surface of the airs, uh, uh, as, um, as uh, Yelanta Badrot and the rest of the members of that team uh, thought, 
but also uh, the way in which a pavilion continues to be such a fracture, such a, a break in the continuity of the structure of a, of a specific surface, to include within that um, a narrative, uh, the expansion of a project that wants first and foremost to overcome the geographical entity or the possibility for an artist to dream bigger than he or she can or they can, uh, if, even if that framework is provided. So there is something about the, the, the publicness that the pavilion allows, the legitimacy, the opportunity of gathering, the platform, the space of political representation, even beyond the specificities of the national framework that I think are worth for the pavilion to uh, assist. But if you ask me, how will they then fall out? Thanks. <laughs>
and the foregrounding of the agency. I am looking at some kind of a, a different mode of annotation of the uh, pavilion within a Biennale. And all of you have, in fact, offered entry points into a, a different modality of thinking through uh, that goes beyond the grammar of, of critique. Yeah, I'm not saying that critique is not important, but I think it has been overplayed a bit no? in, the, uh, in the practice of annotation of the Binale system. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on this possibility of a moment beyond that, uh, that critique. Yeah. So anyone could start, maybe Elvira, you'd like to, 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 to begin this conversation? <laughs> oh, Vera, you, you're muted. <laughs> you have seen somebody at my back now because oh. I basically uh, temporarily squatter in a room in Sander House, which is one of the venues of the Documenta in Castle this year. As you know, uh, Ruan Grupa is the collective, uh, artist collective that was chosen to, to take on this incredible project. And I, I have to say, we are not disappointed, those of us that thought that this could be an opportunity for um, a particular uh, uh, event, no? for the arts such as Documenta, where I think if you always level and test the ground for some of the things that perhaps have happened in the previous year, but also some of the, the things that will condition the future. No? Um, mm -hmm. And it's very interesting, although there had never been uh, um, national pavilions in, in Documenta. There is something very interesting about what you're saying. No? As, as you were introducing, I was thinking, well, this edition of Documenta already proves that the moment that you are highlighting is already here, right? In the sense that you have a collective that have established a system of uh, resources sharing, a system of knowledge production, a system of speculative collectiveness uh, in which all of that is first proposed as a platform uh, of equity to understand, one that forced the structure leading the documenta, no? uh, um, leading, let's say, the power structure, city, the documenta office, etc., to understand that there is a different way to address the economics behind the presentation of an international event such as this. No? And, I'm, and I mentioned Documenta again because there are so many, um, there are no national representation. In fact, probably there are countercultural spaces in the nations where they're from. But what is beautiful is that we have experience when you go through the venues, you experience many um, possibilities of engaging with the culture of a place in a way that perhaps is much more um, open to the radicality, the precarity, the, the notion of resistance and resiliency that are received on the place today in a way that uh, a national pavilion will never be able to make it. No? Not only because of the decision-making into, you know, whatever, there is always a commissioner or a curator and then an artist, but also because the expectation is not an object or an object based or an experience based, um, a, a, let's say, event or experience that carries the meaning uh, that entails the pavilion. No? So, what is interesting here is most of the places are to be experienced, not to be seen. Uh, most of the spaces are to be lit, not to be just passed by. So, the consumption of whatever imaginary, which is not a projection, no? Like I remember there is a moment where you're talking in your in your paper, Patrick, about this the projection that the 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 the, the pavilion offer, right? Like the possibility of imagining, right? Mm -hmm. And here you have people that are contesting the actual and factual reality they live through in you know Mali, Indonesia, um, Algeria. Uh, South Africa uh, and Sudan and so many other places. So I think uh, sort of uh, trying to, to, to connect with what you're saying, that the third way that you were suggesting is already here. 
in, in a way that artists and artist collectives and organizers of documenta have formulated um, their engagement to, uh, to uh, art display in this edition. Like, like the nation is no longer the, the privileged uh, collective, right? <laughs> that there is exactly, a, exactly. A or, or, or is as, uh, is as futile, no? Uh, as, and as, uh, or as capable of organizing something as you wanted that to be, right? Like these collective are sometimes in some cases are institutions or para institutions but they, they don't necessarily are restrained by administrative orders and methodology that we know that are commanding, no? uh, uh, that are leading a, a nation state a configuration. So the, that, that capacity of freedom no? that, that they evocate is incredible also to think about collectiveness in a way that that's, there is no constraint of an identity that is imposed to a majority of citizenship. No? Thank you, thank you, Elvira. And and Cisle, can you can you weigh in um, and maybe offer your thoughts on on this uh, a particular issue? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. And uh, well, look, I I do believe that uh, we have to see in different perspective. From my point of view, if we think of Venice Biennale, uh, Venice Biennale was. Uh, some kind of built through this political attitude of nations showing the best of the nation itself. Um, now, uh, countries in countries like, uh, let's say, call, let's say uh, countries that never had opportunity to show, like if you see, if you see, let's say in Africa, in Asia, in South America, in Balkan and stuff, the look uh, uh, of Biennale Venice from 90s and on as a platform where they can share their own experience through the means of identity and the nation become a supporter to them, not necessarily by selecting the artists, but they showing the power and brightness of the new generation or ge historical generation that belonged to the nation. Uh, we cannot underestimate that because of course I am, I am the first that I would like to uh, pavilions to disappear because I do believe in the power of the artist. But uh, coming to that stage of disappearance of the pavilions, mm -hmm. to me, uh, will somehow uh, make us submissive to the, our strength of our history without we having the voice to the spaces and where exactly system is based. System that when you go to United States and Britain, in Europe, they, they passed that stage that national identity to them, it's so, so, so important. But today when we talk about national identity, we never think what really does mean this. So mean uh, we have to be distinguished into something that we can identify in ourselves. So we, let's say this, today in France, if you think the France, uh, that you cannot call, call or say they have kind of need of having kind of national pavilion. But for them, identity is a champagne if they produce. And for them, the pride of patriotism to them is a product that it's competing, like in Italy, Chianti, like in Germany, BMW, Audi, become kind of identity to the nation. Now, we as a nation, as we are coming through the process of being who we are, whenever our voices was heard, the art scene, especially Biennale Venice, who is politically, uh, as, as attitude of architecture, uh, historically thinking, it's a, as an emergency for upcoming countries and identities in the world. And if I will be, if I will make something really kind of thinking of utopia, because to me, utopia is love, there is no space and no time. But in that case, I will take away, let's say, British uh, pavilion and I will, I'll leave to Uganda, or, or let's say I will shift that American pavilion to Iraq pavilion. So I will do the shifting of things that the art really have no border of thinking and how the power of an artist become not to be hided by architecture itself or by hiding by national identity, 
that become the strength of this magic experience of exactly what Elvira was saying, because that is the only thing that democracy, at least for me, it is the field of art that, that give the, to everyone experience such unique, with such unique sensibility to create something magic. So when I think about global scale, I, am, I do not underestimate that political attitude, what Dennis Bionale present, but I do believe we should not be submissive towards how we should think really globally, who I think is so important, but we should come to the stage that the nature of Africa or nature, the beauty or colorful of South America or Asia, it's not underestimated with this kind of global way of thinking when it's in relation to just products and economy. But we have some depth, we have some spirits, we are not containers. And when we think of that, we have to give something beauty. And when I think beauty, it's about experience exactly what they say, but still it's so emergency to give the voices to other identities that we never heard about them and, and in, in the world. And that's why, to me, Vienna Venice have to question their own policy and politics, you know, especially towards the, 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 the hunger, intellectual hunger where the people can bring and can reestablish something really magic to the, to the Vienna of Venice. And again, I believe in shadow in terms of power of the artist, and that should we talk about language of the artist, and of course, identity is something more complex. It's not something just like to define with two words, but I do believe uh, there is so many components that we need from other countries, from different countries, from different nations to bring some quality and beauty so we can be challenged. Because in the end of the day, it's about challenging our sensibility, our momentum of time with beauty, with the aesthetics. And in this case, if we want to go beyond of uh, being submissive in terms of why we need this, we not we just need, but we need to question the system of the art through the art, especially the national identity and give this platform. Yeah, but you, do you foresee, uh, Cicely, that at some point, the aesthetic condition will transcend the national condition? Um, uh, I, I, I do believe in the energy of unique individuals, wherever they come from, who somehow you can define that as an identity of the region of the small village where they come from, but you can never neglect that beauty. And that's we never had this, this space and giving opportunity to these experiences. And that's why to me, nationality, yes, is important. Is that necessary? Big question. But is it necessary that France have pavilion? It's question mark. Is the necessary uh, Belgium health pavilion? It's question mark. But can have, let's say, Bangladesh pavilion? Yes, I will go for it. But can the other countries that we don't know, but they have so much unique to share with us, something so special, we have just to learn from them. And is a question mark. Is a quick to question the system. And of course, nationality, you cannot materialize into just a word and a form. But the experience of whoever come, wherever come, bring some root from in and they bring something magic to the own experience. And of course, if you want to define that, if it's identity, it's a question mark. But if I think of, let's say, Germany, we think right away Gerhard Richter, okay? Now, or it's a product of Germany or just the German system. We do not neglect, we, we accept that. But mm. do you know any kind of kind of Gerhard Richter, let's say from Brazil, or from Uruguay, or from Zimbabwe? Do we know anything of them? Do we know anybody who are in the system of art, embraced, and the question the time? Because the art is what they do. It's not a role to present the country. It's his own, art, own artwork, unconsciously building his own time. He might not be conscious, but the artwork itself has to be all in time. So within 50 years, we'll recognize the, the power of this artist. So that is me. Yeah, thank, thank you, Cicely, for that. Uh, Manre, I'd like to offer your thoughts. Yeah, when I think of a uh, pavilion, actually in the case of, uh, uh, of Venice, Spain, you know, uh, we, we tend to see it as a, a almost like an assembly of pavilions assembly 
of nation states. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, this, uh, this assembly, uh, it's contingent on so many things, which sometimes uh, when we talk about pavilion would really ignore or, or neglect uh, to mention. First of all, it's, uh, it depends on the nation state system and, and on, on, on geopolitics. And uh, so, so that is the, the strongest uh, situation, the most critical situation Taiwan has to face uh, for years. And, and on top of that, there is a contingency on capital, on capital. And so this, uh, 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 where there is capital, there is possibility to join the assembly. And, and that's, you know, that's where normally, a, a, you know, the critical voice would, you know, would come in, in the, in the case of Venice. And the, the third thing is that, you know, assembly uh, should be more, more, should be beyond uh, just the nation state, no national pavilion. Actually, assembly should be uh, also assembly of sub-nations or micro-nation or sub-nation with like, sovereignty from different places. Uh, I'm thinking of particularly uh, some, you know, so many sovereign uh, tribes uh, in the world, indigenous peoples, and, and all these voices are not uh, represented, you know, in, in, uh, in, in the case of, you know, of Venice or in, actually in general in contemporary art. Yeah, so when we are talking about contemporary art, we already tend to talk about a kind of uh, a, a, his, a, a system of histories mm-hmm. where so many histories are not in it at all. I think that's, yeah, that's the main problem that our contemporary art system has to face uh, beyond the question of, uh, of you know, of public, the national pavilions, and and that's uh, that's where I you know I would approach it uh, in in the case of, of Venice. And if we mention because Evila just uh, talked about uh, the case of, of Documenta fifteenth, uh, uh, it also the con- you know it's also actually contingent on uh, uh, the, the the board of. Uh, the board of Documenta, who selected uh, a group, you know, a Ruan Grupa, because they know Ruan Grupa has, you know, the tendency has all the, the intention, experience, uh, and even the idea to really bring in uh, different voices from around the world, you know, beyond the nation state uh, 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 identity in issues. And, and that's why, it could be a lot more interesting, you know, to bring, you know, to have a documenta, a 15, to say, okay, there are different critical voices, you know, from different parts of the world that can be just there. And I think in that sense, you know, it's an assembly of, you know, critical voices, assembly of uh, of muted or silent uh, places. And I think that's, that's uh, uh, quite significant in, in this case. And that's also where uh, uh, the multi, you know, multiplicities of, you know, of histories you know, can, can be seen. And, and I think that in that case, you know, it is quite different uh, than, you know, than, than you know, Venice Biennial. In Venice Biennial, actually, there are so many uh, uh, beyond the you know, national pavilion, but there are also the satellite shows. You know, actually, Venice Biennial has like three, five hundred shows, you know, at a time. So, yeah. And, but given the big number of that, you know, we still have to, you know, see like who can join that big show, who can, who is, you know, uh, uh, able to to join this assembly. And I think that's, you know, the the case of Venice. And the, that that question is beyond uh, the question of pavilion. It's actually, it's you know, totally more about uh, uh, capital, more about how contemporary art uh, system function. 
Yeah, yeah. It's good, uh, Manre, that you brought up the term assembly. And this brings me to my second question about, uh, about Taiwan, about Taiwan, which presents a, uh, an important case within the Biennale system, uh, because the, uh, the claim to nation of Taiwan has, has been refused, right? And has become contentious, but uh, Taiwan has persisted to be to be to belong to this to this assembly. So my 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 question is about this desire, about this desire to belong, in spite of the uh, uh, intense refusal uh, of uh, of certain systems not to include uh, uh, certain perspectives or voices or or discourses. So how would you, the three of you, look at? Um, articulations of like non-nationness, like non-nationness or maybe statelessness or even continentality, because I think uh, Elvira also mentioned the, the case of Africa as becoming part of the system, which is not really you know, a nation state, but a, but a continent. And also maybe pre-nationness no? uh, via the indigenous cosmology, which uh, which uh, Manre has uh, importantly uh, foregrounded. So, how would how do you think should uh, the Venice system of uh, pavilions? Uh, how would it be able to like absorb or mediate these articulations of uh, of things that are beyond uh, beyond the reckoning? Of uh, of the nation, yeah. Maybe we can start with uh, with Cicely this time. Okay, Cicely. Oh, you're muted. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, when I uh, when I when I say the Venice Biennale, it's. Uh, Political attitude, mm. uh, rather than art, and I want to believe that it is otherwise. Uh, mm. So the art is more important than the political decision from some nations to not allow, let's say, mm, because a nation it's a state of mind, but the power will determine who be and not be it is extremely aggressive and violent. Mm -hmm. Who are the people who can say that Taiwan is no nation? We can invent in our nation as well. We should, we should go beyond of the um, geographical thinking of terms and thinking who decide. Let's say, who is an artist? Is an artist somebody who go with a tie? And look beautiful, have beautiful hair, or it's somebody really that shake and question the time and system, and in terms that bring something special. It is it is unacceptable from my point of view. Then anyone uh, is when the Venice Biennale become uh, so exclusive, and that we should question should be inclusive, and not to be rejected in any form, in any nation, or any dream of being nation, however, we should give the platform. Because only through that, we can grow up, we can learn, and we can make sure that the world is not just something geographically they can, because we have to build history through the art, because geography is not interesting to us. But if we think history to build through today, and, the, and that can do only the artist, and if you give, if you neglect, if you deny the space, that's mean you absolutely are doing crime towards the individual and to the nation itself. So for me, it's absolutely unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Cicely, for that. Uh, Man Ray? <clears throat> um, I would like to stress um, the importance of a uh, nation state. Mm. Especially uh, if we look at how the whole world function, you know, currently or in the, I would say, okay, in the last three hundred years at least, when 
the uh, nation states uh, pluralize uh, everywhere around the world. And currently, um, nation states still remain a very important uh, agency. Uh, it, in the case of art, uh, like in Venice, or I would say, for example, you know, it, uh, uh, WHO, so far, WHO excludes Taiwan. So Taiwan has no share of the COVID-19 information or no, not first-hand share in a sharing of that. And then so, so uh, given the nation state uh, system, uh, um, how, um, you know, uh, health medical information uh, can be shared and how scientific uh, information can be shared around the world. It's about knowledge. It's about uh, uh, epistemology and it's about different kind of you know, cosmologies uh, can, 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 you know, can join together in, in there. And then so uh, given the nation state and uh, you know, what it is at this moment, uh, so many, as I said earlier, you know, sub-nations still have no way to, uh, to share information, yeah, to share knowledge. And so, so nation state is, a, a, is an agency, <clears throat> is an agent uh, uh, for, you know, for the current uh, global uh, society. Uh, it is actually both like, dangerous and important, yeah. And I think that's uh, uh, just one, you know, uh, art and medical information and uh, so many things. Uh, it, young, the young, uh, the war, young, the, the, you know, the, the, the all different regional uh, geopolitics. Yeah. And then, so, so in the case of uh, a national pavilion in Venice, uh, I would like to also add, uh, you know, the fact that uh, there are many other issues where nation states still, you know, function as a excluding uh, agency. In many places, uh, many societies are not represented uh, 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 scientifically and, and also medically. And, and I think that's a very important issue. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Thank you, Manre. Elvira? Yes, I mean, there, there are so many things, beautiful things that have been said. Um, I want to, to go back to recover something you said at the very beginning of this question, which was this issue of the desire, no? which I understand uh, both in relation to non-nationness, uh, but also in relation to the pre-nationness, right? And the capacity for legitimacy that an event like the Venice Biennial give you mm -hmm. to this sense of... Um, is not uh, being recognized as a nation state, perform as such, right? Like, so, the, so, the, so the, the pavilion became a possibility of performing that yeah. right uh, and, 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 and access to a certain sense of legitimacy. So the desire, whether it's political one or it's from a collective, that is, you know, a collective desire, a collective agency, let's say, that is claiming for, found its place of recognition, right? Like that would be, for me, one of the things. And, and, and here I see what you were saying, Manre, earlier about this system, no? This, this system of, this system of, um, of, uh, of histories that is perpetuated through the process of being, being accepted, which at the end of the day, um, there is a, there is a, a, a perverse uh, no, a system behind an event like the, the, the Venice Biennial, because you have this sense of, of or any biennial for that matter, no? Like if you cannot belong, you can do off biennial and, you know, in places like Dakar, it's critically important, right? Whatever is happening outside the main exhibition venues is as, as crucial and sometimes even more crucial than the biennial itself. Venice Biennale, this is another league, no? In the sense that, Everything that happens outside of the main pavilions had to pay is is way in, no? Both uh, symbolically, but also in, in capital terms, no? You really had to invest. 
And of course, because we have that freedom, as as Sisler was saying, of demanding that to the nation, right? Demanding the nation to have a representation, no? Like I, I could think also in a in a pavilion as important as the Catalonian pavilion, which I don't remember exactly the year that it started to be present in Venice, but is claiming in a way this this also this sense of nationness that is searching for a legitimacy outside. So the so whether an opportunity for an artist to present their practice is also uh, a political stage in which all this power are also rehearsed and, and put it into, into a context. But there is something that was also mentioned in the, in the uh, I mean, this beautiful sentence that you use, uh, Sisley, that nation as a state of mind, but also nation of, a, of, a, of an opportunity in the case of places that are not represented usually in the established pavilion, uh, of the opportunity of, of bringing, let's say, um, uncanonized forms of beauty, right? That like you were talking about this, like how can we engage with something that somehow, uh, first and foremost, can be so far away from us, no? Like if we have like the Bangladeshi Pavilion or here where we have so many Indonesian um, representation, but also as I was saying, Mali, as, 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 but but through, no, for instance, here is the foundation of Festival Niger, and that's where you find some of the Mali contender, or there are these different uh, structures, right? Uh, but the, what I think is exciting about this, and sorry to bring again, uh, um, maybe because I spent two days immersed in, in this uh, exhibition. Um, what is exciting is also the curatorial making and exhibition making. It's absolutely different as well, right? It's not only the beauty, it's, a, it's the way that the beauty is, is, is told, if you want, right? Like it's the way in which we engage of a, of a specific ways of narrating, of a specific way of exhibition making, and all of that constitutes for me that next stage that we would love to see somewhere else. Mm -hmm. How one goes from a space like Documenta that happened every five years where now there is this investment, both conceptual, almost like an embodied investment um, of our being and who we are, what we like, how we engage with it. No, it, it really is an exhibition that you can pass by, but, the, but if you really want to experience, you have to be there, you have to partake, you have to sit down, talk, drink, eat. How that, how this, which is radically different to things that we have seen at this scale. Of course, mm -hmm. some of us could name uh, so many experiences in our cities where that happens, but not to the scale that we see here. How that somehow goes to a place like Venice. I don't know, and I don't know if I want it to be, right? Like, I feel like, the reason that this exists in its form is because there is Basel on the one hand, Venice on the other, etc. Right? But again, uh, so one 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 thing is that the political desire, and the other is the artistic desire that also plays a role, a role of legitimacy among your peers because. As it happened in Spain and in Catalonia, imagine you are chosen by a jury of experts in art. So there is a change that, you know, like this sort of like this, this chain that is created around the production of an artwork that then is immersed in a pavilion setting. And that also plays not only uh, to nationalness or, or non-nationalness, but also to the representation, the political representation, the artist as a political bearer of or, uh, as a bearer, sorry, of a political representation, both for the, the nation, for himself, herself, for themselves, right? And that, I think this is also a key for me in thinking about what can one uh, produce in the context of that kind of uh, exhibitions. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Elvira. And maybe for my last question, which is a, a lighter one, uh, if one, if there was one, artist or curator who would be given an opportunity to be part of uh, a pavilion in, in Venice, if that artist or curator would ask your advice, what would you <laughs> tell him or her? What would be the most productive attitude or approach towards an involvement uh, uh, 
in a pavilion within the Biennale system like in, in Venice. So I'd like to start with uh, Man Ray. This is a very uh, tricky question. <laughs> <laughs> um, don't do uh, it. Yeah, <laughs> if do you it. say don't do it, <laughs> anyway. Okay, just do it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, a, a years ago, in Taiwan Pavilion, uh, selected a curator, a Taiwanese curator, who invited uh, non-Taiwanese artists uh, to be, you know, to be part of the, the, the national pavilion, and that immediately created a, you know, a huge riot, criticizing the museum, criticizing the curator, criticizing the committee who selected uh, that curator. Yeah, so uh, a national pavilion, uh, there is always one limitation, which is that you no, know, it's a uh, it's about your you know national status, nationality. Yeah, and of course, since uh, many years, there are uh, 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 pavilions, for example, like French pavilion. Uh, would uh, have one artist from you know a, a Chinese artist, uh, uh, Huang Yongping, and, and and all that. But those are artists already based in uh, in in in, uh, in in France, yeah. And also, it also has to do with how this big nation uh, is able to be inclusive. And in the case of Taiwan. You know, a, a you know Taiwanese pavilion itself. Had. While this uh, pavilion has already its own problem, and how can we invite uh, uh, artists you know from uh, you know in outside of Taiwan? Yeah. So this, uh, I think, the argument is legitimate. The argument against uh, invitation, you know, of the non-national. And and so that that is by itself. It's a you know it's a it's an interesting question to start with, and I think I have no answer to that. But it's a very uh, 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 as I said, you know, your question is tricky because you know we are mentioning we are talking about actually what can you do and what you what can you not do, you know, in the nation you know in the national pavilion. And that question actually, in many ways, is similar to what can you do in one particular museum and, and, and what can you not do? Yeah. And there's the limitation of capital, limitation of the organizational uh, 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 in, you know, identities and, and so on. So uh, if we say, uh, uh, if, uh, you know, if you ask me this question, uh, you know, I would say, okay, go for, uh, go for it, but go for the limitations, yeah, mm -hmm. and see how what you can do, you know, beyond that. Okay. That's my answer. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Manre. Yeah, uh, Elvira. Yes, hi. Uh, so that's a very funny. I, I love how you responded, Manre. I think I will. I will say. Um, I will say, do it. But if you have any concern and you do have concern because you ask me, use them, right? Use these concerns to produce something that also talks about your hesitation or what that means for you as an artist, or what that means for your nation, if you belong to it, or what that means in terms of the system. And I don't necessarily think that you can't, one constantly had to address this as an artist. Maybe this is a conversation you have with the curator. I think, unfortunately, those opportunities are great for artists. So I feel like bad to, even when I also think like Cicely, that somehow the pavilions should be, you know, avoid them completely or start playing this game where, you know, there are rotation and other nations that have never been in Venice get to uh, participate or that don't have the means to be in Venice, get to participate through an invitation by another pavilion. Um, I would say that, yes, one has to do it, but then has you have to use the hesitations to, 
to work around it, to question it, to, you know, in their own nature, right? Like everybody in their own nature. So, um, but, I, but, I, but, I, but it, I think it's, it's really tricky more and more uh, to be able to, or to, to mention somebody, you know, you shouldn't do it because of political reason. Although if you have them, just face them, right? Like, I won't say to you, the decision is yours, but I will say use all of that that provoke you to, to challenge the system. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's very instructive, Elvira. And the final word is from the, um, the sovereign nation of the artist, uh, Sisley. <laughs> uh, well, I have two things to say. First, don't be afraid. And the second, kill the architecture, metaphorically. That's all. Architecture might be landscape, might be architecture physical, just kill and don't be afraid. So. Yeah, thank you. On that note of a possible creation of something new after the death of the architecture, I, I would like to thank uh, Sisle, Manre, and Elvira for this uh, wonderful <laughs> conversation. It's just a beginning, I'm, I, I'm sure, of uh, a future conversations be between us and beyond us. Uh, I'd like to thank you for making the time. Uh, it's a different day already in Manila. <laughs> <laughs> the one midnight, but uh, we enjoyed every minute of it. So thank you, Sisley, uh, Manre, and Elvira. All the best on your different endeavors wherever you are. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much, Elvira, Manre, Patrick. Thank you.大家好特别的一个转型跟变化的期间这个展览的第一届就是由我来带出去的他经历了非常非常多的变化做了一个小小的回顾的性质我觉得也是非常重要的重新来检视威尼斯双年展台湾馆到底对台湾对艺术界对世界它到底是处于什么样的状态我们又面对什么样的议题这次的主题展览主题叫做不可能的梦 要去推动跟执行威尼斯双年展台湾馆的这个角度来讲，我其实觉得它应该是啊，Mission uh, Impossible 不可能的任务。嗯，想想看，呃，今天主持人丢给我们的呃第一个呃重要的关键就是是什么构成了国家馆，就是所谓的National um, Pavilion。呃，事实上我觉得。万事皆有其 
因缘，或者是说机缘，也就是说 timing 其实是非常重要的。我们先要检视是什么构成的国家馆。呃，我们都了解威尼斯双年展，它本来就是由国家馆出发的，它在应该是二十世纪。初呃，十九世纪末的时候，他界定的就是国家之间要相互显现他的文化能量所做的一个世界性的集合。所以国家馆，然后推动啊、呃、代表国家意向的艺术家来参展，这是他本来就有的历史。可是对台湾来讲呢，我们应该要这样讲：从台湾从圣保罗双年展之后。我们几乎都没有艺术的这个领域，几乎没有任何的国家资源或者是国家平台。那威尼斯当年成就了这件事情，对台湾来讲是何其重要的一件事。当然，我们知道，在那个机缘里面，啊、呃，就是说，呃，独特的，呃，国内呢有它的独特的环境，也就是说，政府部门呢也不也。没有经验，要如何去推动这样一件事？但是在那种状况之下，啊、呃，除了北美馆的同仁们的毅力以外，我觉得还有当时的前任馆长的一种意志力以外，我觉得其实啊、呃，我要必须要提到，当年有一个跨部会的会议，那是由文化部的副主任委员刘万航先生他来主持的，要不是他出面，要不是他。愿意去同整，像外交部、文化部、新闻局诸多国家级的单位，还有教育部，好，对于一个国家的艺术的计划的支撑，不会有今天的台湾馆。那那一个起步里面呢，当然我们就先要思考一件事。我今天回头来想，呃，国家馆展艺术，其实我认为没有好的艺术，就不会有好的国家馆。所以，在我心中，我觉得如何去展现台湾的艺术，让它享有国家的资源跟平台的配置，让它在世界发生，这个才是真正的关键。所以，在这个情况之下，艺术本身其实是优于国家的位置。也只有在这个条件之下，艺术可以跨过国家或者国际的这些边界，可以跟世界沟通。这个，我觉得一直是我心里面认为。相当关键的一个一个呃指引，对我而言，好，那是什么代表了？呃，是什么构成了国家馆？好，那我讲到当时的这样子的一个缺乏国家级资源的这样的一个情境之下呢，这个独特的环境其实也形成了当初的台湾馆的推动是万所瞩目。好，同时因为。呃，长期的没有国家资源，以至于今天有了讲落谁家这件事情，变得变成是一个非常非常的严肃，而且是大家都很在意的事。这是第一个议题。第二个议题呢，就是说，今天这个国家馆是由呃公部门的美术馆来办理，但是在那个年代里面。我们长期对于官僚制度的不信任，也形成了大家用非常强力的眼光来去监监督这个体制的发生。而这两种的缺，哈，一个是对官僚体制信任的缺，还有对国家资源到位的缺。这两个缺，它形成了北美馆每一年每一届要主办这个威尼双年展的时候，几乎沾染了一种原罪的性质。嗯、um, ，在这个情况之下，我不得不说，呃，我是佩服北美馆的。不管有多少的子弹，不管有多少的问题发生，他都要很坚定、很自信的把那个展览好好的推向国际，啊、呃，不曾间断。甚至有一段时间，我还在想，既然北美馆形成了威尼斯双年展。是不是有一天北美馆也可以决定不要再做威尼斯双年展了呢？好，这个自我提问是在于非常多层次的呃原罪性，以至于让他呃背负了非常多的枷锁。好
呃，然后非常多的社会的高度期待、艺术圈的一种想望，我们都要能够含挂在内。所以，其实从某个角度来讲，呃，我应该这样讲：威尼斯双年展呢，它本身它是是一个光环，但是事实上，从另外一个角度来讲，它根本也是一个紧箍咒啊。对于呃很多事情的。发展往专业上面去推动的时候，它有它各式各样的，嗯，我们要去面对的意识形态，哈、啊，或者面对了权力结构跟资源分配的议题，啊，真正要回到艺术议题这件事情呢，还要跨过那些藩篱，它才能够好好的触及到。呃，在这个情况之下，我想，二零一五年就是别说再见，吴天章，这是一个首次。以个个展形态来举办的，呃呃，这个台湾馆的展览，嗯、呃，我必须要回顾啊。其实，二零一五年我一上任，就直接去了威尼斯办理开幕。可是因缘际会，我其实就是选出吴天章作为代表艺术家的那一届的评审团的主席啊，呃，就是呃，在这个情况之下。呃，在那个过程里面，我见证了许多事情，好，而这些事情呢的见证，其实对我当之后当馆长如何能够把台湾馆推到更好的位置上面，他有了非常好而丰富的经验。威尼斯双年展这么多年来，他应该从我想想看，从二零零一年开始到二零一三年，呃，十几年间，哈。它其实都是以呃策展征建的方式来举办，也就是说，从两千年开始，台湾正式步入了所谓的策展的时代。而这个策展人的时代呢，事实上，我们从业界还没有这么充分的策策展人，到后来我们年轻时代的策展人，也可以站上站上国际的呃这个舞台，然后需有甚至需呃拥有各式各样的国际经验那样一个时代。他其实走把这个威尼斯双年展啊、呃、带到了一种高峰，好，那但是话说回来了，当二零一四年我们要呃这个进行下一呃二零一三还是一一四年，我们要去呃这个选出下一届的这个这个艺术家或策展人的时候，当时的北美馆做了一个决策，他们决定要改成是艺术家的个展，好。呃，我那时候作为评审团，我直接问了同仁，为什么我们要忽然改成了个这个个展？我说现在不是策展的时代吗？然后我们的策展人也越来越多元，也越来越成熟，为什么我们不再做策展？呃，不再做策展人提案，而去做这个艺术家的个展？当时同仁有一位同仁从非常技术面来回答我这件事。这件事情也深深烙在我的心里。这个同仁告诉我说，因为啊、呃，每一届的这个这个群展啊，好、哦，就是策展案，总有一群艺术家，所以为了要顾到群展里面每一个艺术家的充分表现，所以在一个比较相对狭窄的展览场里面，其实美术馆要花掉非常多的资源去处理艺术家每个艺术家之间的隔间的议题，还有。很多内部空间的施作，而这些耗下去的资源，它并不竟然在艺术本身。所以同仁们觉得这个技术问题呢，好像做一个艺术家的时候，可以把资源更加凝聚在艺术家的身上。这个时候是某一个同仁回答了一个美术馆在内部持续要面对的，就是做展览的技术问题。当时呢，我其实。呃，我还我我已经离开美术馆二十多年了，哈。我当时的第一个反反应，就像我好像就是身在艺术圈，我第一个反应其实我是质疑的。我的这个质疑呢，是在于不是在于个展这件事情，而是在于说一个国家馆怎么会从一个技术面的角度来去思考如何去配置资源。可是这个质疑，事实上也就变成我在担任馆长之后。我会去全方全方位要去思考的问题，那我到最后我不得不承认，技术问题其实是一个事关绝对绝对重要的议题。好，嗯，我记得
，当年就是呃，我做了评审团主席，选出了吴天章啊、哦。那个时候没有策展人，就是单一艺术家。其实我也记得那个整个辩论的过程，其实大家有高度的共识。嗯，所以当我从二零。一五年一上任五天之内，我就必须要担任馆长的任务，去到了威尼斯双年展的时候，在我致辞之前，我重新去思考了这件事情：为什么啊、呃、选出吴天章如此的具有共识？我觉得问题很简单。终于时间来了，这个单一的艺术家，因为台湾当代艺术发展超过了三十年。这一些能够代表台湾的艺术家，他不但浮出了台面，他们不再是所谓的新生代新锐艺术家，他们已经变成十足成熟的艺术家。同时，他们也代表了台湾当代艺术整体创作环境的成熟。所以，这个三十年之路是并行着威尼斯双年展的发展，而吴天章做的一个呃跟台湾议题绝对相关的呃一种一种一呃这个表现。呃，事实上，呃，也充分具了我们在呃台湾馆里面企图要去寻找的台湾性，所以这件事情呢，就理所当然的这个所谓的千呼万唤始出来。好，那在这个情况之下，我觉得三十年的台湾当代艺术发展的这个场景呢，呃，以及威尼斯双年展历届来走的颠簸路，也因为这些因素。让我在现场致辞的时候，我红了眼眶。好的，是什么构成了国家馆？呃，是千变万化之举，构成了台湾的国家馆。这千变万化之举呢，我们涵盖了我们面对的国际局势，好，我们面对的强大的邻居，经常对我们的关心跟探问，我们面对了在艺术生态里面。如何去找出代表的策展人，或者具有代表性的艺术家？同时，我们要面对当时当代的国际处境，在那样的个处境里面，我们该拿出什么样的策略？也就是说，威尼斯双年展台湾馆，它不是单纯的一个艺术展览，它确实是一个台湾的平台，在国际上面有利的平台。我们从文化初级的角度来讲，不得不说它是一个关键之时。而在这个过程里面，我们的国际策略相对要显得重要。就像我刚刚前面所说的，假如没有好的台湾的艺术，它怎么会成立一个所谓的国家馆？那另外一个大局的变化，就是我们的方法论。每一届不同的策展人，以及在我任内所面对的。不同的个展的艺术家，艺术家性格之之差别，然后他们做事情的方法、程序的差别，他们艺术的多元，这些事情呢，都形成了如何做这件事情有了千变万化之局。而北美馆作为一个啊、呃、所谓的啊、呃、威尼斯双年展台湾馆的专业团队，我不得不说，他是一个了不起的团队。好，第二个问题，国家馆又产生了什么？好，至少我们知道了，在台湾的这一个，我们对国家馆的看待啊、哦，当然在国际上面怎么看待国家馆这件事情，本来就有它啊、呃、这么多年来的议论。好，那对台湾的特殊情境来讲，我们希望建构自己的国家馆，可是也是因为机缘的关系啊、呃，没有水到渠成。但是事实上，国家馆又产生了什么呢？我们回头来看，这个国家馆在国内对于台湾产生了什么样的一种变化？第一个，它对于一个啊、呃、这个专业的呃这个呃展览的执行团队，也就是北美馆本身，它影响了一个馆长的思维。早在一九九五年，呃，威尼斯双年展台湾馆。诞生的机缘里面，其实，嗯，我当时就面对了作为展览组长，我就面对了极大的艺术圈的压力
，好、哦，嗯，我不知道接了多少电话，有艺术家跟我抗议，为什么是那些人？为什么我不在里面？好、哦，嗯，那个时候，当然我做完那个展览，我就刚好离开了北美馆，好、哦，嗯，也就形成了我每两年我就会关注这个展览。啊、呃、的发生，啊、呃，然后他成就的方向，每一届都很精彩。好、哦，嗯，我不太知道是不是大家在做所谓的不可能的梦，而这个不疼不可能的梦里面，有极大一个部分就牵涉到我们有一个模糊的国际的政治身份这件事。那在这个情况之下，我试着去摸索。我先讲了，呃，第一个重点。就是当我二零一五年啊一一四年担任这个评审团主席的时候，同仁告诉我是一个技术的问题，想要让他回到呃所谓的艺术家的个展的这件事情。其实，当我上任的第一件事情，我要去面对这件思考，不应该只是一个技术思考，而是一个国家策略的一个议题的时候，我重新回想了这若干年我对于这件事情的观察。我试着要去聆听，我觉得这个时候聆听是一个重要、非常非常重要的能力。在馆长的思维里面，我要聆听到底台湾的艺术界怎么去看待这个国家馆，即便有的时候出于焦虑啊，出于一种对于资源分配或者是某种权力结构的不安所产生的一些提问，但是这是现实，这是台湾馆的现实，我们没有办法忽略它。假装它不是这么一件事，所以在这个情况之下，我忽然发现有一个功课非常重要，就是假如评审团到场的时候，各有各的梦，大家一起来做威尼斯双年展台湾馆的梦，我会发现大家会同床异梦，也就是说，每个人都有自己的想法的时候，用自己的想象去思考台湾馆是什么的时候，我觉得这是一个有问题的的结构。所以，我当了馆长之后，我第一件要做的事情，我开始去整理台湾馆应该要有一个国际策略，而这个国际策略呢，应该是啊、呃、北美馆在这件事情里面最重要的主张。而这个情况之下呢，我认为为台湾馆定一个远程的宗旨或者比较近程的目标，它应该是势必呃是呃怎么讲势必要做的。所以我整理出来三个面向，可以把它视为远程的想望跟近程的呃一个要去追求的事情。第一个，当然最简单也是最容易明了的，就是国际化的需求。啊、呃，在这里面它牵涉到各式各样的国家的意识、好主体性，还有主体认同、文化认同这一系列的呃非常关键的议题。但是话说回来了，这件事情我们不是只是在一个政治场里面，我们其实也是在一个艺术专业场里面，它得要有非常成熟、呃，非常丰富的艺术成就。而这件这个艺术成就呢，它不竟然是一定要谈国家主体性这件事，它可以谈台湾，可以谈生活，可以谈世界，可以谈族群。可以谈非常宽广的议题，那在这种情况之下呢，我觉得台湾的一种艺术成就能够在这个场合里面能够做充分的表现，这是他第一个要去、第二个要去追求的呃目标。第三件事情，我经常听人说，同时呢，应该早在那个年代，我们在国际上面不只是没有国家的资源，连在民间想要在国家做呃，想要在国外做一个展览。都不是那么通畅的事情，我们缺乏策展人的这种培育，我们缺乏资源，然后甚至经常会听到，假如北美馆做了这么多年，懂得如何操作一个国际大展，是不是应该要把这个技术分享给大家？我觉得这个道理太深切，而且我们迫切的需要做好。所以以上三个大的呃方向，三个重要的主旨。就形成了这个国家馆，它应该要扮演的这种呃角色跟位置，它不是只是单一的，它是三重的。
在这种情况之下，我们尤其在我上任二零一五年的时候，他历经了所谓的历经了策展时代的来临，到我们的策展时代的趋于成熟跟丰富多元的这样一个变化之下，我开始召开，不只是定了这个威尼斯双年展台湾馆的。它的宗旨或者是三大目标，同时呢，我也开始在我们真的进入到所谓的呃推荐的会议或者是审议的过程里面呢，我们会产生一个呃在事前我们有一个前置性的共识会议。我觉得共识会议非常的重要，就大家聚在一起，大家先不去想我要推荐谁，大家先要想我可以为台湾馆做些什么事。我们应该要如何去让这个台湾馆的面目是清晰的，而不是模糊的，而不是各说各话的？在共识会议里面，其实有一个非常重要的功课，北美馆必须要做，为呃参与的委员而做，就是我们一定会做一个简报，去介绍历届的威尼斯双年展台湾馆它的历程。他发展的一个在那个时代所扮演的角色跟重点，在那个时代我们的收获是什么？所以这个历史的认知，其实正是酝酿我们共识很重要的过程。所以其实不必有太不会有太多的疑义，大家很快的就凝聚在一起。那这样子的一个共识呢，当然这里就会有一个关键的语言。那我们应该要选出什么样的个展艺术家？推荐呃，推荐出来什么样的一个艺术家？而这个艺术家他关心的议题，他表现的形态啊、呃，他所操作的语言，在国际上面是不是一个比较通畅的语言？呃，因为当我上任当馆长的时候，北美馆的策略已经呃办理了吴天章这一届的个展的策略，所以我的第一个对我自己的提问就是：假如我们说到台湾。当代艺术发展成熟的一代，这一代的人口有多少？表现杰出、持续创作有多少？也就是说，我们的个展策略可以维持多久？它能够达到有效？呃，事实上，我心里想，至少要三届。也就是说，当我上任的时候，我算过我的任期，哈、啊，我想我大概可以啊呃,呃，怎么讲？呃，参与到。呃，三届的发生，加上吴天章这一届，总共或许有四届的时机。那我认为这四届投入在各展的这个艺术家的这种推荐制度上面，我觉得应该没有意呃没有问题啊，它应该是可以充分的，能够让我们这个世代呃所谓的台湾当代的这个创作的第一代啊，它能够有啊、呃、非常充分的一些表现的呃契机。而且是从不同的面向，这件事情要支撑多久，它可以让单一艺术家的呃选择没有疑虑哈、哦。那我想，这个必须是只要它能够支撑多久，它就应该要去推动的事情。同时，我们当然也可以去回到呃艺术双年展啊、呃、这个大的国际的会展。他所具有的时代精神，他内部的辩论而讨论上面，而我认为在这个时间点，就是呃，独立策展人，还有呃，各式各样的艺术生态的分化，在当代里面的情境，我觉得在威尼斯双年展里面，即便是做个展，也有了非常多，每一个国家馆都有它非常不同的一些策略。那在这个情况之下。呃，这位代表艺术家，他到底代表的是什么？好、啊，这件事情，他在一个呃呃所谓的跨国的时代，在一个呃网络让大家都回到同一个地球村的状态，在这个情况之下，我觉得这个艺术家他讨论的议题，其实是可以突破早先国家馆所具有的紧箍咒，而。呃，应该要让它变成是一个台湾当代艺术的一个光环。呃，在这个情况之下，我其实也跟同仁一起商议，我想要企图去处理台湾的文化事业的发展上面，对于国家意向的一种呃呃不确定感所形成的
呃，我认为是比较消极的一个国家策，一个一个国际策略是什么呢？就是台湾渴望被凝视，也就是说，我们希望我们这种不确定的身份呢，可以受到国际上更多的专业人士，甚至是整个国际的这个呃呃艺术圈的一个重视，这种被渴望凝视的这一个角度呢。形成了长期以来比较消极的一个一个态度，而那个焦虑之所发生，也就在于说我如何展现自己，才能够招来别人的凝视。好，我觉得这个想法该改变了，尤其在今天的时代，所以我提出了一个新的国际政策的呃国际策略的视角。这个策视角是什么呢？台湾。是个非常独特的地方。那在这个情况之下，世界要是少了台湾，我们其实会这个世界会少了一块。好，那在这个情况之下，也就是说，我们对于国际的社群的参与，非台湾不可。没有台湾，这个社群会少了重要的一块。而台湾呢，在这个社群的参与里面，有我们可以提供给全球的贡献。我觉得在这样的一个角度之下，我们是充满了自信，而且我们会去呃呃去看我们跟全球的关系，而不是只会看台湾跟自己的过去的历史的关系。我觉得这个视角的转变呢，形成了我们接下来的几届在处理代表台湾的艺术家的时候，方法改变了。或许我们可以啊、呃、回视一下。从二零五一五年的吴天章，到二零一七的谢德庆，到二零一九的郑淑丽，好，那在这个历程里面，我们到底得到了什么？国家馆到底生产了什么？这件事，呃，吴天章那一届，我刚刚前面已经提了，大家对于台湾性的表现。几乎吴天章，呃，毋庸置疑的去担任了这个角色。但是呢，在这个过程里面，我们发现了一件事：，其实，在吴天章做展览的过程，他要做他梦想中的展览，其实是啊、呃，技术上面具有高度的困难要去克服，尤其是在威尼斯双年展台湾馆这样一个场景里面。所以我们看到了一个非常孤独的艺术家。那他要在现场，不但要制作自己的艺术，同时他还要，嗯，可能想象自己是一个统领大军，要进行国际战场的一个，算是一个指挥的将领吗？我后来发现，这样的角色落在一个艺术家的身上太沉重了，而他也不是需要去扮演啊、呃、这样的一个一个。呃呃，所谓的处理国际策略的角色，在这种情况之下，呃，我们开始意识到，要把艺术家最最做最好的呈现，其实我们需要一位策展人的陪伴。这位策展人呢，他才是真正在现场，他可以呃运用我们的国际策略的方向，然后指挥这整个的技术的团队，能够让他达到一种国际上可以通行的语言。同时，这位策展人呢，也要为台湾的艺术的生产能够在国际上做最好的对话，甚至做最好的辩论。那在这个情况之下，国际策展人，我发现他跟这位代表台湾的艺术家，他几乎占有同样重要的位置。可是，在谢德庆的这一届呢，我们并没有先去找策展人，因为我们意识到，艺术家才是这个中。最重要的要去表现的角色，那在这个过程里面呢，我们决定美术馆并不参与艺术家推荐的制度，而馆长只是作为这个辩论跟推荐会议的主持人，让大家可以充分的沟通跟交流。当我们一旦产生了谢德庆作为这一届的代表艺术家，北美馆接下来要去做的，如何去说服谢德庆？让他知道这是一个非常非常重要的契机，即便他个人对艺术创作上
有他个人的非常多的原则。在这个情况之下，我们当然用了好的沟通的方式，说服了艺术家，同时我们也开始跟艺术家讨论谁才是对的策展人。我觉得跟艺术家讨论，去对一个个展来讲，来去生产出来适当的策展人，绝对要比倒过来做要来的，在艺术的专业执行上面是更加有效的方法。好，除了国际策展人，我们这一届请到的 Adrian Hisfield， 他其实本身也是跨领域的呃艺术学者，他跨了表演艺术那一块，所以对于谢德庆在国际上面行为艺术的这个。历史发展上面的关键位置，它可以从多重的角度去进行国际的对话，所以更不要讲谢德庆本人在国际呃的这种呃行为艺术的发展上面，他几乎是呃前驱者。在这样的情况之下呢，谢德庆的推出立刻引起了全球的艺术社群的焦点跟注目。那在这个情况之下，我想我们再也不需要。担心我们在威尼斯双年展的台湾馆呢，不能称为在国际上不能被称为呃 national pavilion， 因为我们称我们为台北市立美术馆，但是所有来参访的国际重量级的贵宾，或者所有的媒体报道，他都称我们为台湾 pavilion， 这是一个国际上面的认同，而不是来自于。我们要刻意的去主张，我想这件事情是一个非常非常成功的一个策略。第二件事情，我们发现，在威尼斯双年展台湾馆的现场呢，过去我们可能认为找意大利人来去看估我们大概四个月的展览场，可能是一个在经济上面比较有效的做法。可是我长期的观察，我发现由意大利人来说台湾的故事。会说到不痛不痒，所以我发现必须要在现场有我们呃台湾的呃这个呃发言者哈、啊，他能够发出更多台湾社会的一些普遍现象，呃，我们认为自己是谁的这样一个声音，同时他也要能够有效的去介绍这个展出的艺术家，所以我们就回应了我刚刚所说的三大宗旨里面的第三项。就是我们如何去培养国际的策展人，然后让这个国际的策展技术能够回到年轻一世代世代的身上，让它能够被运用，然后去为发展台湾未来的呃这种国际艺术的这种发展的一种一种呃技术的能力。在这种情况之下，我们开始培养呃台湾馆的实习呃呃实习生啊，那这个实习生呢？其实也带着一个呃未来的一种呃这种策展的一种观念，所以他们虽然暂时之间扮演了现场的志工，但事实上呢，他不但是啊、呃、形成一种嗯、呃、非常精彩的青年的生力军啊，他们有一点点像是自己人来看顾自己国家的展览的这样子的一种啊。呃志气哈，以至于他们在现场扮演了非常棒的角色，也对现场的观众来讲，啊、呃，也让大家感受到了呃，我们的一个呃，怎么讲呃，多年来在文化发展上面的一个非常独特的的位置。那在这个情况之下，第二步呢，其实在这些年轻人里面，因为他我们是跨领域招收来的，我们认为跨领域也是一个未来的策展人的一个。一个呃，算是一个方向啊，所以在这种情况之下呢，呃，跨领域来的年轻人，他们能够透过这个机会认识艺术，同时呢，也能够呃，去呃，发展自己对于在国际上做展览的一种比较呃广、比较宏观的一种视野，我觉得这是非常非常重要的。接下来我谈一下郑淑丽这一届，好。那我们这一届呢，其实，在策略上面，当郑淑丽被推举出来的时候，呃，呃，其实因为他长期在呃这个呃性别议题上面的研究，广泛受到推荐委员的认可，所以这个性别议题呢
，很自然而然，当郑淑丽知道他受邀来担任这一届的代表艺术家的时候，他就非常严肃而用力去回忆、回忆、回应了他一直以来所关注的这个同志的议题。那在那个年代里面，其实就还没有，就是前几年了，台湾也正在酝酿酝酿这个同婚的议题。也将近要达到一种高峰。当我们知道台湾今天不只是在国内，同时是在国际的场域里面，可以呼吁对呃这个所谓的跨性别的呃尊重啊、呃、跟重视跟研究的时候，我们知道这个国际策展人相对非常的重要。那我们跟郑淑丽讨论，所以出现呢呃现在在年轻的这种呃学术呃论述里面非常重要的 Paul Preciado。啊，呃，由他来这个担任这一届的策展人，这是非常，我应该说非常完美的一届。有关于策展人对于艺术家的认同，对于台湾处境的认同，呃，极尽他所能的去连接艺术的社群以外呢，事实上在这届里面呢，我们也突破了一些有趣的事情，就是说我们让威尼斯。这个城市本身的历史啊啊，大家应该还记得威尼斯情圣吧？好，那这个城市的历史，当它回应到同志这个议题的时候，我们选择了 public program， 它本身举办的场地，其实就是在许久在世纪之前，它成为一个呃这个呃这个禁锢或者是。呃，这个约束这种所谓的心灵不正常，呃，这个这个精神，呃，这个呃异常，或者是呃把同志也放进到这样的领域的一个精神病院。好，那在这样一个场地里面，我们去处理了这个这个郑淑丽的呃议题呢，充分去结合了威尼斯这个这个城市它本身的一个呃在性别议题发展上面的历史。我觉得相当相当的有趣，也引起了呃这种国际间的一个重视。那这两届的这个展览呢，其实呃台湾馆都当选为呃前十大的最值得推荐、最呃专家推荐、最值得观赏的呃国家馆。好，那同时我还记得开幕那一天，应该是五月九号吧。然后我们五月二十号好像就是公布了我们的同婚法，好，所以在五月九号这一天，我们优先跟世界宣告了台湾同婚法的成立，而且它是亚洲第一个国家能够去定出这样的一个法法规，而去保护呃这个跨性别的族群，呃，同时郑淑丽她的作品本身。充分动员了台湾在数位艺术、科技领域里面的佼佼者。那这个合作的过程呢，充分展现了我们在虚拟世界里面作为一个科技之岛，我们所具有的一个领先的位置。呃，在这一届里面呢，这几个议题应该是台湾馆的另一种突破，甚至我们企图去触及到。啊、呃，是否能够收藏这整个的计划？当然，这又回到了 timing 本身。我想，不只是北美馆，世界上很多的这种呃美术馆，对于数位艺术、科技艺术本身的收藏，仍然充满了各式各样的挑战。所以，它有一点点像是呃功败呃这个这个垂成啊，这个未尽之志。那在这样一个发展的过程里面，我可能稍微稍想要提一下，本来这一届所提出的这个呃萨古流作为一个代表的艺术家，也是一个未尽之志跟功败垂成。但是我们姑且不论这个呃呃事件它本身的呃个人性啊，但是我要回到北美馆在初期的时候，针对这件事情。仍然在啊啊、呃呃，怎么讲？极尽所能的去运作，它在国际上面应该要引起社群、国际社群的一个重视。所以在这过程里面
，我们也发动了跟威尼斯双年展，呃，其他以原住民为议题的国家馆的联系，想要作为一个联盟。同时呢，我们也在刚好进入疫情的时代，呃，发出了一个我们该是是一个时机，不是只是相信科技的发展，我们应该回头来。跟古老的社群作为一种学习。讲到这样，我想要说的，台湾馆它是一个很复杂的地方，它不只是要最好的艺术家，我们也要有一个跟全球能够对话、通行、一起关注、有所贡献的一个平台。同时，我们也需要有一个最好的、最优秀的做。展览的部队才能够让台湾馆成为一个卓越的馆。我觉得台湾馆，即便是个展呐、啊，它也不是只是在处理一个艺术家的个人成就，它其实是处理一个台湾的文化议题。它其实这个艺术家，他的议题是要展开一个文化探讨的平台，而不是仅作为一个个人艺术家的成就。我觉得这件事情，呃，北美馆要掌握的很好，才能够把它呃做的特殊，对。而对台湾馆来讲，它的收收获绝对不是一个个人，它是一个集体的收获。